Okay, this is a review of what I went over today in class, but hopefully it's a little more organized and succinct. Okay, today we went over the OSI model, which is the Open Systems Interconnection Model. Uh, you could see right here. The Open Systems Interconnection Model was created by the ISO, the OSI is created by the ISO, the International Organization for Standardization and it standardizes communication functions of a computing system. And I just grabbed that right from Wikipedia, basically. So it's a theoretical model or conceptual model for uh, network communication in a layered hierarchical approach. There are seven layers in the OSI model, uh, the application layer, the presentation layer, session, transport, network, data link, and physical. Now you have to know these layers for your Cisco CCNA exam. And I always use a mnemonic, please do not throw sausage pizza away. Now I picked that up from one of my students the first year I taught this course 17 years ago. Please do not throw sausage pizza away. So th this layered approach helps um, compartmentalize uh, networking and the develop of development of network applications and hardware into separate layers. So let's talk about those layers. Also, the OSI model is a theoretical model because what was actually adopted is the Internet Protocol Suite, also known as the TCP IP Protocol Suite. And the TCP IP P protocol suite, we don't number the layers, we just say application layer, transport layer, internet layer, and link layer or network access layer. Now, I've got an asterisk here because the application layer in the TCP IP protocol suite is made up of the application presentation and session layers in the OSI model. So basically, if you conflate these three layers into one layer, then you have the TCP IP protocol suite application layer. And then the link layer here, or network access layer, I've got a little plus sign here, and that is the that corresponds in the OSI model to the data link layer and the physical layer. So let's talk a little bit about what these layers do, and it's also a good uh, recap for what we learned today. So at the bottom of the OSI model, layer one, the physical layer, it's the layer of bits. It's the layer of basically uh, ones and zeros. It's also known as the layer of the media, whether it's copper, ethernet cable, twisted pair, uh, fiber optic cable, or radio waves in a uh, wireless signal. It's the physical layer is the layer of the media. It's also the layer of network interface cards, your network adapter, your Ethernet port, or your Wi-Fi port on your computer. And it's the, also the layer of hubs. Now, we don't really use hubs too much anymore, but I'm putting it there just in case. Then the data link layer, this is the layer of physical addressing, meaning MAC addresses, if you have an Ethernet port. It's also the layer of switching and switches and network interface cards or network adapters. Notice your NIC, your Ethernet port, functions on the physical layer. It's a physical device and the data link layer, um, it has a burnt in MAC address right on the card. It has a physical address. Okay, the network layer is the layer of logical addressing. It's the layer of IP addressing. It's also the layer of routing and routers. The transport layer is the layer of ports, which is a logical communication between application processes. So port numbers. So port 80 is usually a web server. Well, that's an application process, right? That's an application, a, a web server, port 80. Or let's say uh, um, port 22. Um, uh, SSH server or something like that, an FTP server. Anyway, it's, the, it's a layer of ports and other things, which I'll talk about in a second. The session layer is where we open, close, and manage sessions between end user application processes. So managing sessions between end users regarding the application. So that this, once again, these top three layers are pretty much all part of the application. Presentation layer deals with the file formats and compression. And then the application layer, this is the top layer, it's the layer closest to the user, and it deals with the programs and services. So what are we talking about 
when we're talking about some of these things here, let's let's go over it again. So at the application layer, what are those programs and services? They are HTTP or web service, HTTPS, secure web, the domain name system, DNS, file transfer protocol, file server, um, FTP server, uh, simple mail transport protocol, email, telnet, remotely connecting to another um, shell on another computer, secure shell, SSH, a DHCP, where we get automatic IP addressing, and secure socket layer, transport layer security, SSL, TLS. And there's many more applications or programs and services that operate at the application layer. And then I've got a note here, for all open protocols, see request for comments at tools.ietf.org uh, forward slash HTML. A lot of these internet protocols are open protocols that um, we can see this, the, the proposals for these protocols if we go visit ietf.org and look at the request for comments. We'll do that in a second. So this is the type of protocols that exist and the types of services that are at the application layer. At the presentation layer, I tried to find a, a protocol. So MIME types, file types are at the presentation layer. The session layer, real-time transport protocol or real-time protocol is a uh, is at the session layer. This is for video streaming and voice streaming and the SOX protocol. Now let's talk about these layers here. These are some of the uh, bread and butter here. So the transport layer is the layer of TCP, which is a reliable connection oriented protocol. It, it's, this is the workhorse of the internet. UDP, the user datagram protocol, which is a connectionless non-reliable, it's not a reliable protocol, but it's a lot faster and leaner than TCP. So TCP is reliable, but a little bit slower. UDP is fast and lean. It's a smaller protocol for faster communication. This is what you use for things like gaming, voice over IP, video, where you don't have to necessarily rely on the fact that every packet or every segment got to its destination. Uh, TCP, very reliable. This, once again, is the workhorse of the internet. Now, a lot of these protocols, like for instance, HTTP uses TCP, but DNS typically uses UDP. DHCP uses UDP, but FTP and SMTP, they use TCP. All right. At the network layer, the protocols of the network layer are IPv4 addressing. Um, this is the internet protocol. Uh, IPv6, which is a newer standard um, for IP addressing. Uh, ICMP, which is what we use when we, we ping or, or send hello packets to a computer and we do a ping and a pong and get a hello and a reply. And ICMP for IPv6, for ICMP version six for IPv6. It's also the network layer, the layer of IPsec and IP security built right into the, the OSI model. The data link layer is the layer of MAC addressing. MAC addresses, if we're dealing with Ethernet, it's also the layer of wireless Ethernet, Wi-Fi, and you could have things that are non-Ethernet related like uh, DSL or point-to-point -point protocol, uh, WAN protocols basically. And then at the physical layer, we deal with the encoding of ones and zeros or the bits on the wire. So I've got some more information here. Um, another thing that we did in class was, is I took the students to YouTube and we typed in search for what is internet anyway. That's a pretty fun thing that we do in the class. And uh, I recommend that you guys do that. Go to YouTube, uh, put in a search for what is internet anyway. It's pretty amusing. Okay. Um, TCP IP protocol suite, I've got now, instead of dealing with the layers in the OSI, let's look at the layers in the TCP IP protocol suite, the application layer, transport, internet, and link layer. So the protocol data unit or PDU of the application layer is data. Now we have our, our data, let's say our email or our file that we wanna send or a picture that we wanna send. And then at the transport layer, that's where our data, our file gets broken up to pieces and then sent across the internet in different pieces. Those pieces are called segments. So the PDU of the transport layer 
is segments. And then the PDU of the internet layer are datagrams or packets, sometimes we call them. And at the link layer or data link layer, the PDU is frames. And I like my students to think of ethernet frame, an ethernet frame. So link layer, data link layer, we have ethernet frames, internet layer, datagrams or packets. Once again, the internet layer is the same thing as the network layer. The link layer is the same thing as the data link layer and the physical layer. Okay, and the transport layer is the same thing as the transport layer in the OSI model. So data segments, datagrams, and frames. Now, these PDUs, okay, is the, the format of the data takes. And at these different layers, there are headers. So what is in the header information in that, um, in that packet or in that, yeah, in that packet, what's in the header at those layers? Well, at the application layer, you have application specific fields inside of the packet. At the segment, right, in the segment at the transport layer, you have source and destination port numbers. And those source and destination port numbers usually refer to the source host number and then the destination port for service. And we'll talk about that in a second. Like destination port 80 means you're trying to contact a web server. And then your port number on your host computer will be a random number. We'll talk about that in a minute. So in the datagrams, in the header, you have source and destination IP addresses. In the link, in the link layer, in the frame header, you have source and destination MAC addresses. So these are your computer's physical address, let's say. And then uh, the IP address is your computer's logical address. So this is considered, IP addresses are considered logical addresses, MAC addresses, physical addresses. So once again, this is this layered thing. And this is what's in the packets if we capture the packets. Why are we learning this? Well, we're gonna get Wireshark running and we're gonna capture the packets. We're gonna look inside of them and we're gonna see this information inside those packets. All right, then in class, what we covered was a few more things. Okay, a few more things covered in class. We said, hey, a request. So if I make a request, let's say to yahoo.com, first thing that happens is DNS, the domain name system is going to is going to translate this name into an IP address and then my request to go to let's say I want to get a web page from yahoo.com then I'm going to need the IP address and then it's going to be colon port 80 and then that's an HTTP request or a web request so to make a web request I need the IP address of Yahoo and I need the port number I'm going to contact them I'm going to contact their web server that's called a socket when you have an IP address plus a port number that's your socket now on the other hand if i'm trying to get an email send an email i'm trying to send an email let's say to uh, yahoo.com mail servers then maybe i'm sending it to let's say a similar ip address but this time i'm not necessarily the same ip address but um this time the colon number is colon 25 which is a socket that goes to smtp or simple mail transport protocol so um, each, each one of these different port numbers refers to a service or a server, right, that's listening and waiting for connections. Now, when that request comes back, it's called a response. And the response also uses a socket. In other words, when the response comes back, notice the arrow's coming back this time. It's coming to my computer. And let's say my computer is on a private network, but I've also got a colon and then port number here. And that's a random port number that identifies my computer uniquely on the network. So there's my IP address in this case, and I have another random port number that I, I uh, uniquely identifies my computer, let's say, on the network, right? So there's requests and responses. Notice these are the destination IP address and port number, destination IP address, port number, and then this is the source, um, the source, uh, uh, address and port number except when the traffic comes back now this is the destination IP address and port number and I haven't taken into account in class I also talked a little bit about NAT translation and how the router translates the addresses when it goes across the the router firewall and I talked about NAT firewalls but I'm skipping that here so just talk about uh, destination 
addresses and the source addresses on the private network and the destination addresses on the public network. It does bring up the topic of private addressing. What's that? Private IP addressing, what's that? Well, anything that starts with a 10, like 10 dot whatever, whatever, you see here 10 dot 116, anything starting with a 10 is private. It's not routable on the internet. It only works on a private local area network. Anything that starts with a 17216, anything starting with 172.16 up to 172.31, and that means 172.20 or 172.21, those are all private. So that is a private address. So it can only be on a local area network. It's not routable on the internet. And then you may have seen this one before. Anything that starts with a 192.168 is private. So a lot of home networks will be 192.168.0. And then the host number. Let's say your host is 100 or 101 or 150. So anyway, that's private addressing. So let's take a look at some of these things here. So I've got here, what is the internet anyway? And then going to IETF and then request for comments. So I'll open up my web browser. And first of all, what is the internet anyway? 1994 Today Show, definitely uh, it's worth, you'll have a hoot, a laugh if you watch this video of Bryant Gumbel on the Today Show asking everybody, what is the internet, right? What does this even mean? It's hilarious. And then I've got here, requests for comments. So this is the ietf.org, tools.ietf.org, and this is the request for comments for the hyper, uh, hypertext transfer protocol, HTTP, uh, 1.1 is obsoleted by 7.2.3.0, 7.2.3.1. And so if I go all the way to 7.2.3.5 here, I'll get the most up-to-date revision of the hypertext HTTP uh, request for comments. And this is related to, this one's related to authentication. And if I go back, this one is, let's see here, related to caching. And so, and then, all HTTP range requests. So these are, you can see it's multiple um, conditional requests. There's multiple RFCs for HTTP and they get um, updated and sometimes obsoleted uh, by um, newer ones. So this one obsolates uh, 2068, which was an earlier, let's say, standard. Obsoleted by 2616 which is what we were just looking at. Now what you can do is you can also just go here and I'll just go to the HTML. So tools.ietf.org forward slash HTML and then you can search an IET, IE, uh, and request for comment number. So we're gonna look up RFC 4838 and I'll get documents. And this is the request for comments for delay tolerant networking architecture. Um, and this was, let's see here, Network Working Group, Vint Surf. So, uh, and Google and Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And we'll take a look here. And it says, this document describes an architecture for delay tolerant and disruption tolerant networks as and is an evolution in the architecture originally designed for the interplanetary internet. The interplanetary internet, um, we have a protocol. I learned about this from Laura Chapel um, at a, uh, the WASC, uh, the WASC Cisco Academy conference in the winter of 2019. It was a great talk and it was unbelievable. And I thought I would just share that with you um, here. And what else do I have? Oh, and there he is, Vint Surf. So yeah, that's my hero. All right, thanks everybody. I'm gonna make uh, another video kind of recapping what we went over in class today.